Okay, today we are going to start talking about the atom, uh, particularly the foundations of chemistry from a historical perspective, as well as the structure of the atom. And when we first start to talk about atom, uh, we have to go, or the term atom rather, we have to go all the way back to about 400 BC and a man named Democritus. Um, he was the first person that came up with the term and his description pretty much meant indivisible. He believed that you could eventually get to a particle that could not be divisible by normal means, and he called that um, atom. And then along came Aristotle, who was a brilliant man, but from a perspective of chemistry, didn't do us a lot of favors because he did not believe in atoms. Um, he said, nope, I think that you are going to always have something that is able to be divisible and this opinion was accepted for over 2,000 years because um, Aristotle was a brilliant man and also because there was not any evidence or the technology with which to dispute the claims or to provide evidence for one versus the other. Now, so we make a big jump here all the way to the 1700s. Uh, chemists agreed on two things. Number one, that atoms did indeed exist. So they were back to the belief that Democritus held that atoms were present and were around. Uh, they also agreed on the definitions of several terms. Uh, number one, element. They knew different elements existed. They, some of them had been discovered and named and kind of infancy stages of that um, information. Uh, compound. They knew elements could combine into different combinations as well as chemical versus physical properties. Um, we've talked about these terms before where physical property is something that can be observed without changing the identity of a substance chemical you do have to change the identity of the substance. But one thing they did not agree on was the ratios of elements and compounds. They couldn't agree um, on the ratios of how they combined. And luckily for us some new technology led to the discovery of some of chemistry's basic laws. And remember a law is simply of an observation of a pattern in nature. Now the first one is probably one that's pretty familiar to us. That's the law of conservation of mass. The law of conservation of mass states that mass is neither created or destroyed during regular chemical or physical changes. Um, in a practical standpoint, if you could take the mass of all of the substance before you ran a reaction and take the mass of all of the substances after you ran a reaction, um, it should be equal. Okay, or in this one, there's the same number of atoms on both sides, which would mean that the mass was conserved as well. The second law is the law of definite proportions. Okay, now for definite proportions, this is pretty much saying that any amount of a chemical compound, okay, if we have a specific chemical compound, it's always going to contain the same elements in the same proportions by mass. Now there's a lot of scary words in that statement. So in other words, this would be an example of a compound that has copper, oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. And what they're essentially saying is that for to this particular substance, you're always going to have the same percentage of it as copper, the same percentage of oxygen, same percent as hydrogen, and the same percent of carbon. So it does not matter where those substances come from, um, they're always going to have the same mass. Sorry about that. Okay, and then the last law was the law of multiple proportions. The law of multiple proportions Remember, last time, sounds the same, was definite proportions. This is multiple. And here's how I remember them. Um, this applies to when two or more elements can make more than one type of compound. So as soon as you see the term more than one type of compound, we've got to be thinking multiple proportions, meaning that they can combine in more than one way. Um, and simply stated, the mass ratios will always simplify to small whole numbers. Okay. Um, for example, here is an example of nitrogen monoxide, which is one nitrogen and one oxygen. Okay, so this would be our molecule version here for nitrogen monoxide. And then you have another combination, so that's all the way over there, um, another combination of nitrogen and oxygen, and that's nitrogen dioxide, which has two oxygens for every one nitrogen. So you have two or more elements being nitrogen and oxygen and they have more than one combination but it's still a whole number. And for example, even though we may not be super familiar with the subject of chemistry, I think most of us know that we're not going to see a chemical compound written this way. We can't have um, decimals or fractions of atoms connected in the compound. And then again, here's another example of law of multiple proportions where you're still dealing with combinations of nitrogen and oxygen, but you have three different options here. Here you have nitrous oxide, which is N2O. They call it nitric oxide. We'll learn it as nitrogen monoxide. 
and nitrogen dioxide. Okay, so three different combinations. All right, then we jump all the way to 1808, a very important individual from the chemistry perspective, and that's John Dalton. John Dalton came along and proposed an explanation or a theory for those three laws, and it's called the atomic theory. And there were five main ideas. Okay, and those five main ideas included the fact that all matter is made of atoms, atoms in the same element have the same size, mass, and properties, atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed, atoms in different elements combine to, in whole number ratios to make compounds, and in chemical reactions atom can be atoms can be combined, separated, and rearranged. So again, if our definition of theory simply states of an explanation, this was his idea or his explanation of the law of conservation of mass, the law of multiple proportions, and the law of definite proportions. And he did pretty well for the time being. Um, now one thing about Dalton's law is that it was really good for the 1800s, but there were some discoveries and some updates that had to be made once we had new information. Um, the first one, or so, I've stated here, it says some parts of Dalton's theory were wrong. I don't necessarily think wrong is the right term, as I may have just simply should have stated, um, have been updated, okay, and that's what it says here. They've been updated with new information. The first part being that atoms are divisible, and the new information that we got is the presence of subatomic particles, which we'll talk about here in a minute, meaning protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so, in essence, once we discovered these subatomic particles, we just had to update Dalton's theory to include that idea. He wasn't totally wrong, just needed some updating. Uh, the second part to that is he had believed that all elements were completely identical. And we now know that to not necessarily be true, and that we can have isotopes of an atom, which is an atom that has different numbers of neutrons. Okay, so with modern atomic theory, it's all important, but the big crucial idea, big main ideas, are that all matter is made of atoms that we know of. Um, and secondly, atoms of different elements have different properties. And it's this whole idea of both chemical and physical properties, but that's part of what makes different elements useful to us and why they're used in different substances here on Earth.